So here's Julia to talk about putting flow <laughs> back into workflows. Over to you. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Um, like Rob said, I'm Julia Wester. I'm a co-founder of a little company called 55 Degrees in southern Sweden. I'm in Malmö right now. And um, I want to ask you to think about your workflow. We'll talk about specifically what those are, but I think you all have an idea. I want to ask you to think about your workflow and how well you think work flows through it as we walk through the session. Um, a little bit about me and why I want to talk about this. My career is pretty much traveled organically from someone who has basically manage the schedule for web developers. I wanted to be a web developer, but all I could get at first was scheduling them. So I jumped into that at CNN.com and then I became a web developer and you know onwards and upwards. And so now I have this SaaS company, right? And of course that journey had twists and turns along the way. And I've had a lot of different roles at various levels and various sizes of organizations. And through that journey, I learned that it's really important for everyone regardless of role or level, to understand how to deliver value as quickly, smoothly, and easily as possible. And as you take your role higher and higher up in the organization, you come closer to being more responsible for the bottom line of the company, for the people, for their welfare. Uh, and so then you begin to understand this isn't just about meeting dates. It's about keeping your organization financially viable and being able to reach the goals and being able to stay relevant in the marketplace. In other words, we need to be able to do what people need us to do when they need us to do it. And the stakes are pretty high. Uh, we just see them sort of differently from our different positions in, in the organization. So understanding and optimizing your workflow is really a bigger part of making that a reality than we might think. Now, as the owner of a company that creates apps that are focused on flow, flow metrics, forecasting, et cetera, we talk to a lot of customers who are in the journey of figuring out how to optimize their flow. And many of those that we talk to are struggling with getting the data they need to really optimize their flow and improve their predictability because of some design choices they made when building their workflow and how that leads them to use the workflow. So that is what really spurred me to think about what's required in a workflow if optimizing flow is your goal and have this talk. So I tried to encapsulate a lot of what I think, uh, what I've been thinking about and sort of dwelling on. And, and that's come together sort of into a core underlying premise that I wanna share and hopefully get you to buy in on, as well as some things I think you might wanna consider staying away from when you build a workflow and some things I think you can do instead to still get what you needed from that choice uh, without sacrificing the things that are important for flow. So that's why we're here today. And to really dive in, I want to start by defining a couple of things really quickly. What is flow? We use that word all the time, but do we really even know what it means? Are we thinking the same thing? Well, I like to go to the Kanban guide when I'm unsure. And it says that flow is the movement of potential value through a process or a system. Now, potential is a really key word here. Before we start something, we really don't know if it's valuable or not. We have a hypothesis that we have value to gain, but the only way to find out for sure is to deliver it to customers or people, whoever can actually confirm for us that what we delivered provides value, then our company gets compensation in some way or another, and we're furthering the viability of our company. So flow is the movement of a potential value through a system or process. I use system process sort of simultaneously for right or wrong. Now, the workflow is simply a model of that system or process that the work flows through. Okay. And we all know that we probably all heard that quote that all models are wrong. Some models are useful. So your model may not be perfect, but it can still be useful. So uh, don't worry about perfection as we go through this. Now, when we optimize flow, we optimize the movement of work through that model, through that workflow. So we've got our stuff defined here. 
Now, there is a great way to think about your workflow with an economic mindset. And the reason that it's great is one, it lets us speak to upper management, execs, finance people, and language that they understand. But it also helps us to really connect how our work uh, impacts the bottom line of the organization. And so this is good for any person in any role in any level of the organization to keep in mind when we're working on things. Now, if we think about sort of the not started, started, finished bit of our board, because in, in every workflow, we're trying to optimize uh, between some defined start and finish. So for this talk, I don't care how you define start and finish, that's, that's contextual to you. But before something has started, uh, generally that means you haven't put any or much effort or investment into that item. It's just sitting there, it's an option waiting to be exercised. Sort of like stock options, you haven't bought them yet, but they're sitting there, you can exercise those if you want. So right now when things are options, we haven't spent anything, we haven't lost anything. We also haven't gained anything, right? Because we haven't put the work in. However, once you start the work and until you finish it, you're spending this time and money without getting anything in return yet. That's the textbook definition of a liability. So all of our work that's in progress, uh, our lingo is whip, right? All of our whip is liability, okay? Our goal is to cross that finish line uh, and turn it into an asset and I say hope because we don't know if everything will provide the value that we thought there was potential for, right? So in essence, when we optimize flow, we aim to minimize our liabilities and maximize our assets. And we want to ensure that while things are liabilities, that we get them through that stage as quickly and as friction-free as possible. So I think this is a really great way to start talking about your workflow and the work inside of it, inside your teams and across departments in your organization. Okay, so I've said optimize a gazillion times now. How do you know if you have a workflow that's optimized? What does it look like? To answer that, I, I don't know if there's one right answer for that, but I like to think about the path that work items take through a workflow. And so when I think about smooth, optimized flow, I have a picture in my mind of work traveling smoothly from beginning to end, sort of straight through our workflow. No stumbles along the way, no uh, backwards turns getting lost or anything like that. Now, think about how many, you know, do you think that this is generally what happens in your workflows? If you think about your workflows, maybe a board or Maybe you just update statuses in JIRA or something like that. Do things just move slowly through? Um, when I asked this in person last time, uh, I didn't see any hands. <laughs> Instead, what many of us or maybe even most of us have is a journey that looks a bit more like this. <laughs> a bunch of erratic movement in every direction. We move forward, we say, nope, gotta go back here, up, down, all around, everything, right? Um, we often even build our workflows with the expectation, the intention that work will journey through in this kind of erratic way in multiple directions. And I'm not gonna say that's bad or good, but what I will say is that decision causes us to lose a lot of visibility into some key signals that we could be getting into the real status of our liabilities and where we are in the process of getting them complete. So that realization about signal um, of where we are in the process of turning a liability into an asset and how critical that is, that led me to an underlying core premise that I'd like to propose to you about the signals we should be building our workflows to give us, okay? So by far, I think that we should build workflows, and I say should because this is my premise, right? So you can agree or disagree. But my premise is that the position of a work item in the workflow, so which stage or column it is, and I'm going to use stage and column synonymously, uh, wherever it is, should give a signal of how close we are to turning our liability into an asset. In other words, how I move a card in the workflow signals if I'm getting closer or farther away. So if I move a card to the right in the workflow, 
I'm signaling that we're getting closer to being an asset. We're progressing on that journey. If I move it to the left though, I'm signaling that we've learned that we're farther away than we thought we were. We're correcting a signal, right? Oh, you know, we, we thought we were ready to this, but we, we really aren't yet. So we're gonna move it back here and we'll talk about this a little bit more. So when we take this approach to building workflows, it allows us to look at that item's position in the workflow and be confident about where we are in the process and that's all great, but that then unlocks the capability to use our data to be able to make forecasts about how long things are likely to take to get to the asset portion, right? From any place in the workflow, right? In other words, we can forecast using our data with you know, probabilities, how much longer items might be a liability based on where they are, but we can only do that if the position is giving us a signal about nearness to completion. So obviously, if we want to get those signals, the stages have to represent that journey. And we have to be able to understand that journey and articulate the progressive stages going from option to asset. We're going to talk about a, a little bit of that here in this talk. So hopefully you're on board with the premise. I guess I'll see in the chat when I'm not looking at it right now, but we can talk about it at, at the end. Um, the thing though, is that if we don't make the workflow model this journey to potential value, then we've made it to model something else because it's gonna model something. So I would love for you to think about what your workflow actually models. It's critical to understand that because it's sending you signals and those signals are gonna cause you to want to make optimizations. And if those signals aren't about flow, then you're not optimizing flow, you're optimizing something else that maybe really isn't getting you closer to improving the bottom line of your organization. So it's important to know what you're doing and why. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, I've been talking to lots of people about their workflows, including teams at my own company, because, you know, we're, by, we're far from perfect, right? There's a difference between knowing what to do and actually doing it. And, and I get that very clearly now. <laughs> um, and I wanted to share some common design decisions that block the signals that are important for flow. So some places that we, uh, where we make choices that don't let us see, use that position um, to get signals of nearness to potential value. Not only do I wanna say what, you know, maybe not to do or what to avoid, I wanna share some alternate suggestions for how you can still get what you need uh, while preserving the key flow signals. Because when you make a choice, um, you're making it for a reason. So we need to understand why we make that choice and just understand the consequences and see if there's ways to get both, right? Have our cake and eat it too. Now, the by far the most common thing that I see is um, workflows or board columns that closely match the functions of people in our team. And, you know, that might make sense if, um, if that journey sort of also matches to the, you know, the progressive journey of work um, going to or from value. Um, but there are some problems there. Um, when we make the workflow be about the roles that we have on our team or in our organization, we haven't built a workflow that's about uh, the journey that the work goes through from option to asset. Instead, we've built a workflow that essentially functions as inboxes for particular people or roles in, in our organizations. And we like that a lot because it makes it super easy. We can just look at one place on our board and all of our work is there. Super easy to set a width limit and everything just feels awesome. But we haven't created a workflow. We've built a people flow. And another way to say that is that we built a model because our workflow is a model. That model is focused on efficient use of resources. And I, I hate to use the word resources for people, but I'm using it because there's something called resource efficiency, right? And in other words, we have built a, a model that's focused on keeping people busy 
instead of worrying about how work moves through the process and instead of focusing on getting signals about that. So how do you know if you have a people flow instead of a workflow? Because I mean, the titles can be misleading. Maybe you're not using it as a people flow, even if the um, names have some affinity, right? So one little test that's easy to do to find out if you have a people flow instead of a workflow is to ask the people on your team where they go to find their work on the border in the workflow, okay? Now, if they say that their work is always in a specific column, then it's very, very likely that you have a people flow, okay? So how does that impact how things move in the workflow. Well, let's say that I'm a person that's tasked with testing after development is done. And let's put aside whatever your thoughts are about that situation. It happens and that's very, very common, right? And so in this kind of situation, my work shows up in the test column because I'm a tester, it needs testing and that's where you put stuff that has test in it, right? And when I test something, Sometimes I find problems <laughs> and those problems require further development. Lo and behold, there's a develop column and that's where the developers work. So in order to get that development done, I need to move that card back so they can work on it, right? At this point, I no longer get signals of nearness to value because we've actually progressed in our journey to uh, turning that into an asset because we created it originally, we have did a lot of validation, now we're just doing some last final fixes, right? That's, that's forward progression to value, but we've moved it back in our workflow so the right people can see it, right? So we've, opt we've chosen to optimize for ease of knowing where someone's work is, and perhaps the ease of making sure that we fully utilize everyone. Um, and look, resource efficiency, you know, people just not sitting there all the time is really important. But to be fair, how often is that actually a problem, right? And we can find other ways to manage that that don't take away from our ability to use the signal of work um, and it, where it is on that journey to value. The other problem with this design is that it sort of conditions people to put blinders on, to focus only on their column. And if you're focused only on yourself or your area for, you know, over a long period of time, you really stop worrying about what's happening elsewhere on the board, right? That's somebody else's problem. And you become a collection of individuals working on their own stuff. You're slowly disintegrating from being a team that's working together towards a common goal. And that's, that's not really what most of us want. Um, yeah, so not great. So what can we do instead? Well, I suggest that we give a little to get a lot. Right? We have people work across the entire board. So we make the stages of the workflow be about you know, that journey that we try to articulate. Um, but people no longer just have work in one column. So let's say um, we have an analyst. We've got sort of three roles shown here. So we've got an analyst and they might need to do some work before it really even starts, right? Because work happens before start often, believe me, right? And, but they also may need to help during the development phase. And they may also need to do some validation in the post-development validation or testing phase as well, right? Or let's think about a, a QA specialist, right? They're the people who, um, yeah, you might be doing all the testing you want in, you know, when you're developing it, but you still might want some external validation. So maybe they can also be helping um, in the analysis column early up in a workflow, writing some test cases. Um, they could be in the develop column, they could be developing some automated tests if they have the skills to do that. And then in the test column, they might be running those or actually doing manual testing. And so their work can be all over the board. Right. And this allows us to see left or right movement on the board as a true signal of uh, relation to value. And as or maybe even more important, it better encourages teamwork and collective responsibility. People are no longer than judged by the progress or how uh, the number of items in a given column. 
because you can't see that as easily anymore, right? Uh, well, you can see how many are in a column, but that column no longer reflects like John's work or the dev team's work or anything like that, right? Instead, we're having people focus on um, how well the team moves options to assets. It makes it a little messier. That's why I said give a little, because I no longer as an individual have my one place that I can focus on. Right. But there's benefits that we just covered to seeing everything and knowing where you fit into that whole life cycle and that you have value beyond just doing one or two tasks, types of tasks. Now, the names that you use for your workflow stages can really affect how easy it is to embrace this idea of collective responsibility. If the names match too closely, like I mentioned before, to the names of the roles or functions of those participating in completing the work, it's going to be like fighting an uphill battle. So even if you think that those names also reflect the workflow um, or the journey, the progressive journey towards value, I would still uh, recommend trying to make those names a little less uh, similar so that you know, people don't have that mental struggle that, oh, I, this is my title, I need to be here, right? Um, one more thing I wanted to say about that is that, you know, we might really think that this is semantics, um, and it is, but I also want to say, think about this. If, if this task of making names a little different, right, than, than the roles, it's not hard, Right. Oh, it might be a pain in some of your tools, but let's say, you know, it's a one time pain. Um, that one time pain can make it easier every single day for every single employee that's on that workflow to do the right thing. So I think you can do your own cost benefit analysis to see if that uh, is something that is worth your time. So the second thing, the second of three things I want to bring up here, another mistake that we often make when designing workflows is ignoring the fact that we have cyclical activities, right? So it in some ways is related to what I just talked about because cyclical activities often involve multiple roles. So you might move things back and forth as they go back and forth between roles. Um, but cyclical activities, even if we are looking at, you know, the same role, we don't necessarily uh, want to ignore the fact that those exist. Okay. Um, so let's, for instance, say that when we are validating something that we think is ready to call finished, um, we should be expecting that sometimes we'll find issues because if not, then why are we bothering to have any validation in the first place? If it will never ever happen, then we're wasting our time to do the validation. So of course we expect we're gonna find something. So it shouldn't be a surprise that things come up. And when things come up, like I mentioned before, we're actually getting closer to turning that into value because we're finding those last hidden things, right? But often what people will do is to move something backwards to a workflow stage that's perceived where, you know, this is where the thing gets made uh, and out of the stage where it gets tested. So we built a workflow or defined policies about how to use it that expect us to move things backwards. So I'm going to use this finding fixing um, thing to help us uh, dive into some options for, for what we might do. Uh, because when we move back and forth, we're getting these really mixed signals and we're not really getting a lot of good data about how long it's spent in any stage of that progressive flow to value. But there are ways that we can do that. We can, there's ways that we can maybe have our cake and eat it too a little bit. And I'll share, you, share with you a story about my development team uh, that we have right now. So instead of expecting to move things back and forth, we can build workflows that not only tolerate, but anticipate cyclical activities. Um, and we can create policies that ensure that we handle these cyclical activities within our workflow correctly. For instance, a simple thing to say is that we can find and fix things in our validating stage, right? So we have data for how long it took us to get to the point where 
we can really say, hey, we're almost done. Let's, let's do our final validations, right? So then that validating stage, the time it spins there represents the validation plus any fixed cycle stuff, right? So that gives us more visibility, more data. Um, but some people in the past, when I've talked to people about this, they wanted to see how long you initially spend validating the item. And they wanna separate that from the fixing stage. And hey, we can do that too but we can do it in a way that still progresses us forward. So one thing is just create sort of a, a fixing stage to the right. right? Um, now I tried this with my development team. And in other words, we wanted to see what was actually being validated and was actually being fixed. Um, I mean, yeah, I'm gonna go to this thing. So they didn't just want this, like this is, you know, I'm a coach. This is what I suggest that we should do. Um, so we had these two stages side by side, but they wanted things to be in reviewing when it was time for people to review them and in fixing when it was time for people to fix them. So they wanted to have this forward movement, but in between those, have a bit of their inbox thing, right? Um, Here's, here's sort of a couple of things that you can do. So what we did, um, which may or may not be the best thing, is that I said, fine, if you really want that, let's do that. Let's give you your inboxes. Um, when I look at the data, when I analyze flow for purposes of optimizing flow, I'm not going to look at those as two separate columns. I'm going to look at that as one validating stage. And so that's working for us right now, right? I can just roll those things up into one and be good. But we could have also just kept this validating stage and used icons or you know labels or something else that shows up on the card to let people know which one is in which part of that. So there's always more than one way to do what you need. But as long as we're fixing forward, essentially, we're still preserving our ability to get signals. And that's really what's critical here. So when we start talking about cyclical activities, we start to get into granular uh, things that we do as work moves through the journey. Now, what's good to know is that one workflow stage usually contains a, multiple activities. We don't necessarily need a, a 50 column Kanban board or workflow, right? Um, that's way too much work and doesn't give us the value that, you know, we think it would, right? So more work for less value. Um, so we can group activities together into uh, single workflow stages. And then the way that we can sort of keep track of um, when things are ready to move to the next progressive stage towards being an asset um, by using exit criteria. It's just one type of policy that you can use. Okay. This is just sort of a, a common understanding of what needs to have been finished in order for this to move forward. Now, some people have, uh, one of my coach friends, Pratik Singh, he said that some people tell him that having these exit criteria um, makes them feel like they can't progress as quickly as they want, right? They can't work a, work ahead, right? Um, so maybe they, you know, if things are in building in, in this example here on the slide, um, you know, they feel like, oh, they can't start any support docs until, ev until the thing has completely moved into prepping for a release. A good thing to know is that the exit criteria defines what has to be done for the, the card, the work item to move to the next stage. It doesn't stop you from doing things that are you know, farther on and getting a head start if it makes sense. So it's not a barrier, it's, uh, it's something that helps us understand what being in a column really means, okay? Um, think about a, a way to think about this a little more uh, everyday kind of person thing is think about your personal learning journey through life. So take reading. My first son learned to read by the age of four, like we were just blown away. 
I didn't stop and say, no, you can't learn that until you reach the school age stage of your life, right? Because that's where people learn to read. I didn't stop him from progressing in his knowledge. Um, and it also didn't mean that he had suddenly become a school ager just because he had learned that, right? He was still in preschooler stage and he had some additional skills and capabilities that he had gotten a head start on. So you can do the same thing here to the extent that you're not hurting yourself by doing things before it actually makes sense to do them. Now, the last anti-pattern I wanna to share today is adding stages to the workflow that have nothing to do with progressive journey to value. One of the most common examples of this is the beloved or the much hated blocked or on hold column, depending who you talk to. Now, I totally get why having a blocked or on hold column feels like a great idea. You have a lot of stuff on your board. The blocked items are cluttering your view, taking up spaces in your whip limits, blocking you from starting something new. Blocked items can get so frustrating, right? It feels really good to get them out of our visual sphere and put it in a blocked column. But unfortunately, ignoring issues or hiding them under the proverbial rug is a flow killer because moving items over to a blocked column is like turning off a test that fails because it's annoying that it keeps failing. And in addition, this really kills our ability to get signals of how near we are to realizing value. I mean, think about it, where does blocked fit in that life cycle? Does it come after doing? Does it come after validating or testing? Right? We can't answer those questions because it's not a stage of the life cycle. What it really is, is a transient aspect of a piece of work that's moving through the life cycle. Okay. So what should we do instead? A better option is to put that information on the work item, to block it in the place it was when it experienced the issue. That gives us a lot of information. We can see where it got blocked, how long it was blocked, um, and it's just a lot more data that we can use to understand what's going on. And we can still use its position as a signal of nearness to value. Now, you do have other options too. Um, by far, leaving it blocked in place is the best choice, but sometimes you do need to move it, right? If it's gonna sit there for a while and by the time it's gonna be worked on again, it will be essentially like starting over. I really suggest just calling a spade a spade and moving it back to options. Just trash, you know, whatever you've done before and make the data look like you're just starting over, right? You can also choose to say, well, this one's pretty much canceled. We don't need this or we can't do this. In this case, move it to done, but have some flag or piece of metadata that notes it is canceled. And this allows us to segment our finished work into things that were canceled and things that were really delivered and are hopefully assets, right? And we can see all of those situations in our data without losing any signals. So we just have to be a little creative and find ways to have our data cake and eat it too, right? Um, the way we have to understand what we need to see before we can make good decisions that let us see it. Now, handoffs are very similar. If you're gonna use them as a column, you should be able to confidently state where they sort of fit in the workflow. And when it comes back, hopefully it's realizing value so it moves to the right. So those are just a few of the common situations that we often talk to customers about. And so there's many, many more. So I would love for you to share your ideas of what keeps you or other people you've seen from seeing the good signals about flow and even your tips on how to avoid them. Now. I've talked a lot, especially in this virtual setting. I just feel like, you know, I'm talking to the void. So I would love to just recap that if you only remember one thing, if there's one thing you take away, please make it this, the underlying core premise that if you model your workflow so that it shows you um, a signal of based on where you are being a signal of how far or close you are away from realizing potential value, then um, 
then you're going to be on the right track. You'll be able to find ways to tackle the situation and needs that I covered. And you might even find su uh, suggestions that are better than the ones that I've shared before. So that's it. I wanted to thank you for listening and see if we had any questions. Um, thank yeah. you, Julia. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one from you. <laughs> yeah, you know, great, great stuff. Thank you very much. Um, one from you, hi here in, in the chat. How do you consider? You talked about blocked items um, for items that cannot proceed. Uh, how might you well, deal with that? I don't. I think a blocked column always keeps us from getting the signals we need, regardless of why you're mm -hmm. choosing to have it. I think that's. I never say never, so almost never the right choice. So if things that absolutely cannot proceed, the question would be why? And what happens when they finally can? And that gives us information on whether, say, I move it back to our options pool or backlog or whatever we're calling it, right? Maybe we do move it backwards. Maybe that's the right choice, but you need to know why you're doing it. Or maybe if it's like a zombie card, like it's dead, but no one's really admitting it, so it's sort of undead, then we sort of double tap it and move it to done and just call it call it killed, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I would I would say. Um, yeah, hopefully that helps. Glad to answer any Thank other you. nuance. No, absolutely. Uh, a question for me, actually. One of the things, striking things I noticed in your... Uh, talk that was language, your use of language, you know, um, options, liabilities, assets, as opposed to the yeah. kind of, you know, agile is still a relatively new way of working, but it's become the, so there is traditional agile, right? Backlog yeah. to do, doing in progress, done. Um, how significant and critical have you found in your experience the use of language? You know, has it has it made a difference? I do think that language matters. Um, I'm not going to like argue with someone till the you know end of the earth about uh, things. I just want people to understand the consequences of choices, whether they're word usage or whether they're having a blocked column or or whatever. And um, like we talked about one bit of semantics about what you name sort of the in progress stages. And I sort of explained how I think that can have a psychological, like even a, a sub, uh, what's the subconscious pull for people to do certain behaviors that you may not like. <laughs> uh, so yeah. if you can get away from that, then yeah, pay attention to the semantics, right? Um, with the options backlog, um, options is a really good term from an economic standpoint. It also mm. gives you clearly the concept of maybe you will choose not to do some of these where backlog has historically been the list of things we have to slog through and we must do all of them. And so it gives a different connotation or vibe. So, but that said, if you use the term backlog and your whole team understands that it's options, you know, then it doesn't matter as much. It's just that what are the unintended, unvisible consequences that you're not seeing from the choices that you've made? And one final question, just come in now, if we will take a break. Uh, do you utilize workflow as a tool for facilitating team weekly meetings? Can you, can this be a facilitation tool, I guess, is uh, the question. Yeah, absolutely. Like, for instance, uh, your daily meetings, whether they're stand-up scrums, whatever. Um, we often pull up our model of our work and how it gets done. So our workflow, our board. And... Uh, you know, we, we use that to ask important questions because the signals that we get from this visual representation of our workflow are there so we can make sure we're doing the right thing. If we see signals that aren't what we think they should be, that's going to drive us to ask questions. And doing that as soon as possible in our meetings is much, much better than waiting for a retrospective every two, four weeks or whatever. Like, so I really do recommend find, you know, looking at uh, using your a visual version of how you work as sort of the way that you work and not something that you just check for reporting um, because it will lead you to make different decisions. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty passionate about that. And um, I teach a lot of flow metrics in scrum classes and Kanban classes and when we talk about those, we often help people understand ways to look at flow and flow data in different events and cadences. 
fabulous stuff. Thank you, Julia. Um, back to, it kind of comes back to, again, transparency being the kind of best facilitation tool we could possibly have. Uh, yes. Julia, thank you ever so much for your time, for your talk. It was thank brilliant, you. fantastic.